What's going on everybody? Thank you so much for stopping by at my channel today. My name is Ahmad and I'm a first year medical student at the Mayo Clinic. Today I'm going to be telling you how I scored in the 100th percentile on my MCAT and how you can do the same on yours. The MCAT is a beast of an exam, but if you can manage to study for it right and you can do well, you're gonna have a huge weight off of your shoulders when you apply to medical school. I promise you that. Now, while I leave my score up here for y'all to verify, since this is a new channel, I gotta ask you, please leave a like and subscribe on this video if you're interested in more content like this in the future. I'll have more videos on how to ace the MCAT the right way and how to prepare and apply for medical school. Now on to the first question, which I get all the time, and that's should I take an MCAT prep course? I personally didn't take an MCAT prep course and I don't think that they're necessary. I actually think that they can hurt you in some cases because you'll end up spending less time on your weaknesses since you're following a less personalized schedule as opposed to one that you make on your own. The one benefit that I think an MCAT prep course could have is the support and encouragement you'll get from your classmates. That being said, having a dedicated study group of whether that be one friend, 10 friends, or an online community will serve the same purpose as that online study group from your class without costing you an arm and a leg. So in summary for this question, I haven't taken an MCAT prep course. I don't recommend you take one unless you really have trouble motivating and can't find your own dedicated study group. Now that being said, if you don't buy an MCAT prep course, this guy will never leave your YouTube advertisements, and if you hate him as much as I do, then that might be something to consider. No disrespect to the guy, but his ads are really annoying. Anyway, on to the next question, which is, when should I take the MCAT, and in the same vein, how long should I study for the MCAT? Now, whether or not you're taking a gap year, I recommend taking the MCAT as soon as you fulfill these two criteria. The first one being that you finished all the necessary science courses for the MCAT, which I'll list in the next question. And the second being that you can set aside three to four months of dedicated study time for the MCAT. Now, dedicated study time does not mean studying for 18 hours a day or anything like that. It just means being able to study more often than you normally would for any normal class because the MCAT isn't a normal exam. So to get to that point, you might have to set aside some of your responsibilities, work less hours, volunteer less, scribe less, things like that. Now, I know what you might be thinking, you know, Ahmad, I work for a living and I support myself or I have leadership positions that matter to me, things like that. And I completely understand I was in the same position when I was taking my MCAT. I couldn't cut back to less than 18 to 20 hours a week for my job. I had leadership positions that I've been elected to and I didn't want to leave. I had volunteering that mattered to me. What I did wasn't just you know call it quits because I couldn't set that aside. What I did instead was dedicate more time to the MCAT than most people. I studied for it in about six months, which is way longer than most people study for and longer than you need to, if you can do a better job of setting aside time than I did. Now that being said, I know a lot of you don't even have three to four months to study. And I know it's not so much that you want to finish in less than three to four months, but you might not have three to four months. And in either case, I still recommend you follow these tips for success in the MCAT because they're universal whether or not you're, again, studying for six months or two months. No matter what your timeline is, make sure you study for this exam the right way to maximize your results wherever you are. The next question I get all the time is, what subjects do I have to take before the MCAT and which subjects, if any, can I self-study for the MCAT? Now, in my opinion, and this is a pretty strong opinion that I have, you really should take biology, biochemistry, general chemistry, physics, and organic chemistry before the MCAT. Most of you are probably wondering about organic chemistry and physics when it comes to courses that you can self-study or not. The reason that you might think like so many others is that it's okay to get away without taking organic chemistry and physics is that they show up less often on the MCAT. That's not a rumor, it's true. They do show up less often. But that being said, they do still show up at least a little bit on each exam. And some exams, just by chance, have more weight given towards organic chemistry or physics than others. It's kind of a little bit of luck when it comes to the MCAT. And either way, if it's an exam without a lot of OCAM and physics, or an exam with a lot of organic chemistry and physics, you don't want to take the chance on not studying for those courses. And when it comes to self-studying, if you want to do it the right way, it takes so much time and energy, especially because these courses are conceptual and they're hard to understand without an instructor. So I really don't recommend self-studying. If you absolutely have to, then it is a possibility, but you will need to spend a lot more time than you normally would studying for those courses. Now, some of you might have noticed that I left psychology and sociology off of the list of courses that I absolutely recommend you take before the MCAT. And while you definitely can take those courses before the MCAT, it's fine if you have, 
I don't think it's necessary to take them. The reason for that is, is because unlike organic chemistry and physics, these courses are very simple to understand and they're very based on memorization. So you're going to have a long list of concepts to memorize for the MCAT, but it's not going to be a really difficult list of terms to understand. Now when it comes to psychology and sociology courses that you take in university, another reason they're not so important is that a lot of the information you learn there won't show up on the MCAT and a lot of the information you need on the MCAT won't show up in your courses. So what I'm saying is there's less overlap in those two courses between the university classes and the MCAT. The next question that I get all the time is what MCAT prep books should I use? Now, I personally am a big fan of Kaplan's prep books. The reason I like them so much is that they're pretty much comprehensive, as comprehensive as any MCAT book can be, and they're also very easy to understand. Now, some prep books are even more detailed than Kaplan's, and I know what you're probably thinking, well, why wouldn't I want the most detailed one, right? Well, because those other prep books have details that would never show up on the MCAT. You don't want too much information, especially information that you'll never use, and you don't want anything confusing you. Trust me, the Kaplan books are pretty great for the MCAT, and they explain things well. Some prep books, for example, have really easy to understand explanations like exam crackers, but they're not as comprehensive as Kaplan's books. Kaplan is the happy medium. That's the only prep book I used. Trust me guys, I'm not sponsored by Kaplan or anything, but they're definitely my go-to prep book. And they're definitely the prep books that I recommended and saw the most success with when I tutored students for the MCAT. Now, all that good stuff being said about Kaplan prep books, I don't recommend their CARS book or their psychology sociology review book. It's a seven book set and those two books I don't like. The reason for that is when it comes to cars, it's not that Kaplan doesn't get it right, it's that no prep company gets it right. I've been through all their books, they're not helpful, and I definitely recommend a very specific car strategy that I used to get from 124 on my first few practice exams to a 131 on my real thing, which is from below the 50th percentile to the 99th percentile. Since that's a lot of information and a lot of detail for this video, I'm going to release a separate video on that. So if you're interested, subscribe to the channel. It'll be one of the next videos that I release. When it comes to Kaplan's psychology sociology book, trust me, it's fine. But there's an even better resource that you need to be using, and that's Khan Academy's psychology sociology videos. The reason these videos are so highly recommended and the reason I found so much success when I use them is because they're developed in partnership with the AAMC, which is the company that writes the exam. So this entire video series was made in partnership with the AAMC specifically for the MCAT. I'm sure you've seen Khan Academy videos on some chemistry or physics topic and those are helpful but sometimes they have too much detail or too little because they weren't made for the MCAT, they were made for university students everywhere who are in any profession, or looking to get into any profession, I should say. The Khan Academy Psychology Sociology videos are just for the MCAT. They have exactly what you need, no more and no less, and they're very easy to understand. I'll leave a link in the description. It's completely free, and I highly recommend it. It was the only psychology sociology resource that I used, and it was just amazing. The next question that's frequently asked and very important is what MCAT practice exams and question banks should I use? Now, there are three that I highly recommend. The Double AAMC Official Practice Bundle, UWorld, and Next Steps Practice Exams. And I'll go through all of those in order. The first being the Double AAMC. Now, like I said before, the Double AAMC is the company that writes the MCAT. So every full length exam in this bundle, every question bank, is written in the exact style that you'll see on the MCAT. It's as close to the real thing as you can get. As of now, they have five practice exams in that bundle, a lot of question banks ranging in difficulty from more challenging to less challenging, but in any case, they're written just like the MCAT, and I couldn't recommend it more highly. These are the most valuable resource that you need for MCAT prep, and it's the only resource that I think you 100% need to buy. On prep books, fine, if you don't want Kaplan, you can get away with it. You can't get away without this AAMC practice bundle. This resource is so important, I can't just throw in 30 seconds on how to use it properly because there is a way to use it incorrectly and you could waste your most valuable resource. So subscribe if you wanna see a video where I go in depth on how to utilize this resource to maximize your results. UWorld is my next favorite choice for MCAT practice and the one that I use most often after the AAMC official materials. It has over 1900 MCAT specific questions. And the reason I specify that is because they also make practice questions for the USMLE, which is one of the most critical exams that medical students take to get into residency. Now, without a doubt, UWorld's questions are the most similar in style to the AAMC's, 
An additional benefit of using UWorld is that they have even better explanations to their questions than the AAMC has. Every multiple choice answer has an explanation as to why it's right or why it's wrong. And they have review materials so that you can do content review after you miss a question without looking back to your prep book. I definitely recommend it, but it isn't free unfortunately. Again, I'm not sponsored by UWorld. What I do recommend that you do is if you can't afford to buy the three month subscription, get the one week trial and crank out as many questions as you can in that period. Of course, don't do this right away when you start. Do it towards the end of the MCAT studying where you're in your practice phase. Crank out as many questions as you can in those seven weeks. If not, go for the three month subscription and space out your questions over time. The last resource that I recommend for MCAT practice are next step full length exams. These exams mimic the double AMC style more similarly than other prep companies, but they're not perfect. They do have a good mix of reading comprehension questions and fact based questions, whereas companies like Kaplan, whose full length exams I don't like, are just purely fact based and they're nothing like the actual MCAT. So if you want to buy MCAT practice exams to use to build your stamina when you're a little bit further out from your MCAT and you're not looking for 100% accuracy when it comes to you know taking an exam that's like the MCAT, I recommend Next Steps exams. I took about four of those when I was studying and they definitely helped me realize what I was getting myself into. Now my MCAT study schedule is a little too detailed to get into right now, so I'll be releasing a separate video on that shortly. The next important MCAT study question is, how much time should I set aside for content review and how much time should I spend practicing? For those of you who don't really know what I'm talking about, traditionally MCAT studying is split into two parts. Content review time, where you basically are reading prep books and trying to absorb as much information as you can by mostly reading and taking notes and reviewing those notes. And practice, which is you know just practicing for the MCAT by doing practice questions, simple as that. Now maybe the biggest mistake that I see people make all the time when they're studying for the MCAT is that they push back their deadline to start practice because they're not 100% satisfied with the content that they know yet. Guys, if you wait until you're 100% done with content review, you're never gonna start practice and you're gonna have a bad time. You will not do well on the MCAT without practicing for it. The reason for that is the MCAT is just as much about learning how to take the MCAT as it is about knowing facts for the MCAT. And what I mean by that is the MCAT has a very specific style. You have to learn to answer questions in a specific way. You need to have the mental stamina for the MCAT. You need all of those things and content review is not going to satisfy those needs. What I recommend is at least one and a half months just for practice. And that means, yes, you can go back to review content if you realize you don't know something, but it definitely should be 80% practice and 20% content review in that last one and a half months. Understand that practice and practice exams are actually some of the best ways to learn content. For one, it can make things stick that you've seen but just doesn't fit in your brain. And two, it can help you realize that maybe you've misunderstood something or maybe you've memorized a fact but you're not sure how to apply it. Practice is important and it's necessary for the MCAT. I also think that this is a good time to mention that the first thing you should do before you even touch a content review book is take a practice full length exam. The reason that I recommend this is you'll understand early on that the MCAT is not just about rote memorization. It's about applying facts. It's about reading passages. It's about having endurance and having the ability to finish a long exam in the time allotted. Facts obviously are necessary, but they're only half of the puzzle. And honestly, I think that one of the secrets of the highest scoring MCAT takers is that they have this understanding and appreciation of the value of practice. This leads me to the next question, which is how do I prepare for test day itself, the day you take your real MCAT? I have three major tips. These three tips are some of the most important for doing well on your MCAT. And they are fixing your sleep schedule, building mental stamina, and simulating test day exactly. As far as fixing your sleep cycle goes, I recommend waking up at the same time for at least four to five weeks out of your MCAT day. For those of you who haven't tried this before, it sucks for anywhere up to three to seven days and it's difficult because you're waking up earlier than you want and you're probably not getting as much sleep as you want. But once you get through that difficult first phase, you're gonna wake up with so much more energy, feeling so much more refreshed and ready to study. To figure out when you should be waking up every day, consider the following. How long is the testing center from your house? How long does it take to drive there if there's traffic? How long does it usually take you to shower, prepare your food, and get out of the house quickly? What kind of things could come up on test day that could delay your time in getting there? Once you have that time you need to wake up figured out, when it comes to the actual exam date, you're not gonna have to worry about when you need to wake up and if you're gonna get up with or without your alarm clock. 
if you, like I said, if you guys haven't tried this before, if you haven't experienced it, what's going to happen is you will wake up naturally every day at the same time without an alarm clock. Of course, you should have one as a backup, but this sleep schedule thing really is magic, and I definitely recommend it for the MCAT. After the MCAT, I actually think it's a good idea to get into that habit in general, but that's a topic for another time. Now, when it comes to building your mental stamina, you need to be able to practice for a long period of time without taking breaks. The obvious way to do this is to take a lot of full-length exams because you're sitting through six hours of constant practice. But people don't take full-length exams that often, and they assume that it's enough. What you need to do is even when you're practicing normal questions, and even when you're reviewing content, set aside a dedicated time, start slow, maybe an hour at a time at first, two hours, and then up it to three hours, where you're pretty much studying non-stop and only taking a break to do things that are essential, run errands that are important. The bottom line is you shouldn't have your phone out and you need to be focusing as much as you can. Yes, life happens, but you need to be as disciplined as possible because the MCAT really is about stamina and there are so many people who quit when they're on section three of the MCAT. I'm not saying they get up and leave, but they're checked out mentally and they could do about 20% better if they really focused on the exam. The next tip is to simulate test day for all of your practice exams. Before each practice exam that I took, I got dressed and went through my normal routine and drove to the library to take my exam. I honestly also think that it's important to eat the same food on your practice exam days as you would on your test day. The reason for that is that you definitely want to be sure that the food that you eat on exam day on your real MCAT is going to sit well in your stomach, give you the energy that you need, and not cause you any distractions from your exam. I really don't want to get gross, but you know what I mean. If something's not sitting well in your stomach, it's not going to go well for you and you're not going to focus. Another question that I get all the time is how do I prepare for the MCAT when I'm a few years away from taking the MCAT? Now the one thing that I want to make so clear is that I do not recommend pre-studying. I'm going to say it again because if you're asking, you're probably going to do it anyway. Don't pre-study for the MCAT. And when I say pre-study, I mean don't study more than a year in advance. You will burn out and you're not going to help yourself. What you should do instead of studying a year out from the MCAT if you really want to do something a little bit extra is buy your prep books early and compare the material that you've learned in your university courses to what's on the MCAT book. This will help you understand what's important for the MCAT, what's emphasized, and it'll kind of help you get it stuck in your head so when you start reviewing the MCAT for real, you'll be familiar with that material already. Other than doing well in your courses, I think it's a good idea to get involved in research or at least read research papers. The reason for that is, and you'll come to realize this when you start practice, is that so much of the MCAT is basically pulled from research papers or is modeled off of research papers. Most questions on the MCAT come with passages and you have to read the passage, extract the information, and apply it to the questions. Research papers are a great way to get in the hang of this and you can get involved in that through actual research that you're doing or just reading research papers on your own. The number one thing though to do before your MCAT, before you really start studying, is to relax and not to worry about it. Being a pre-med is stressful enough as it is. You don't want and don't need anything extra on your plate. If you really want to spend some time in being as efficient as possible, even then you can do some pre-med activities. But what you really should do is spend time relaxing and doing the things that you love. It's a long road, guys. It doesn't end after just pre-med. You still have medical school to get through and residency. It's a long road to becoming a doctor, and we need to take care of ourselves along the way. With that being said, thank you guys so much for watching. Please leave a like and subscribe to this channel if you've enjoyed it. It helps me out, and it lets you know when I release more videos. Also, please be sure to send this to your friends who are studying for the MCAT. I'm sure it'll help them out a lot. That's all I got for today. I'll see you in the next one, and peace. Take care, y'all.